Men often wait and wait to avoid going to the doc, and then it could be too late. Men's health, prostates, testicles, bladders, and all that stuff, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. It may be a cultural norm or it might be ingrained in the basic mental makeup of men, but we just put off seeking medical assistance as long as possible. The facts are thought that we'd be better off if we visited the doctor a bit more often. Men are just as complicated as the female of the species, just constructed a little different. That alternate design needs attention to keep everything working the way it should. First, let's look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false? Active surveillance, which means just monitoring prostate cancer with lab and x-ray and going without surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, is an option in some prostate cancers. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of, our, each of my essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. And we'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of this show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in for the quiz question. We answer your medical questions about men's health as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is Dr. Eugene Park and Dr. Nathan Bockholt, both of urology specialists in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. Uh, this is your Second time on the show, I can remember the you're kind of a quieter speaker, so don't hesitate to speak up. And but had, uh, people are watching you. You had some um, responses after you went home. <coughs> people definitely recognized me afterwards. Uh, there you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nate, uh, you've seen the show before within the studio. What was that experience? It was a good experience. I mean, I spent a month with you. Uh, years ago. I'd how how I'd, many years ago? I'd hate to count how many. <laughs> you know, I had a patient the other day that uh, saw an older gentleman in his 90s and he's like, boy, you look really young. What are you, 55? And I was like, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting, <laughs> yeah. I'm getting too old. <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, it's been over a decade now. Well, I'll make a comment that you were a great student. It was a pleasure. And I, I uh, this, spending a month with me on internal medicine is probably why you went into surgery. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know right. about that. One of the most common things that you guys see is kidney stone issues. How does that go? Eugene, uh, to tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, we kind of see them all hours of the day. We see them in our clinics. We'll see them from referrals from the ER. Um, classic, worst pain of my life. Blood in the urine. I mean, 10 out of 10 pain. It's a uh, surprising uh, number of people in the area uh, get stoned. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have the same experience. Same experience. If you look at maps of the United States over the last, you know, 10, 20 years, the prevalence in almost every state is going up. And it has to do with diets and lack of exercise and weight and diabetes. All those are contributing factors to having kidney stones. Well, we're having an epidemic of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of diabetes and of weight issues, and that definitely uh, is part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, so what, what could I do to prevent a kidney stone? Drink lots of water. Be more Keep water yourself drinking. hydrated. Try to separate those crystals from coming together. Keep yourself flushed out. Yeah. Yeah, now there are guidelines that show that if you make at least two and a half liters a year in a day, your risk of kidney stones goes down. And there's basically four factors, like Eugene was saying, fluids, fluids, and... Uh, fluids and fluids. Yeah, yeah. Fluids, yeah. Fluids. Four, fluids, four, fluids, four, four, four. 
And salt, salt in the diet is not usually what you add, it's what's already in the food that you're eating. So the more solid, you know, the more salt in your diet, the more calcium that ends up going into your urine. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. I did not know that. And uh, you see a lot of people on these new diets like Profile, these high protein diets, the more protein in your diet, it affects the pH of the urine, which results in higher chance of stones. So just moderate protein, a lot of fluid, low salt, and then citrate that's in orange juice, lemonade, things like that. It's actually protective for stones. What about calcium? I mean, I know that people, there's supplements that people take. I mean, you get it with Tums, but you also get it with milk, but you also get it with calcium supplemented orange juice, you get calcium supplemented this and that. Is that part of it? It's usually not a dietary thing uh, unless you have a very specific absorption issue. But um, yeah, it's usually not a dietary thing. It's more of a salt, they've, salt intake issue. They've looked at eliminating calcium from the diet. They had two groups of people. They eliminated calcium in one group's diet, and then they had just a normal amount of calcium with low, pro, you know, moderate protein, low salt. They had much fewer uh, or a lower incidence of stones. And what they think is, you know, our gut makes oxalate in a day so much and so low calcium diet, you're not binding that oxalate. So you end up absorbing more oxalate and you have higher risk for stones. So a lot of women that are on calcium carbonate supplementation, I'll have them take calcium citrate, which is protective in bone health as well as protective for stones. Especially postmenopausal women, you don't want them to be off calcium, the risk of fractures and things like mm -hmm. that. I, you know, I've often said that the best thing for uh, kidney stones uh, I mean, uh, for uh, osteoporosis is exercise. You know, the, the amount of, of weight-bearing, uh, weight mm -hmm. pounding. Uh, do you think that prevents stones? Diet and exercise help. Um, I think uh, I heard a family doc really simplify it for me one time. He basically tells all his patients a heart-healthy diet and a heart-healthy lifestyle are both mm -hmm. good for stones. Yeah. So, easy way to remember it. You know, and I know that that isn't a men's health issue because women get kidney stones too. But I couldn't help myself because you yeah. see a lot of stones. <laughs> and it's a miserable thing with pain, the pain of a, a smooth muscle tube block, blockage. People will vomit. They can't get a comfortable position. They're moving all over the, 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 the table or yep. the room. Uh, so that's a, t uh, a tough thing. Yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I think people have a misconception that urologists just see men. You know, because yeah. urologists are at the forefront of men's health, but women have kidneys and bladders and kidney stones and incontinence and kidney cancer, bladder cancer. So, you know, we, we see kids and so, but I think, uh, you know, you have this, this thought that when you go to the urologist, you're just seeing older gentlemen in the waiting room, but that's not the case. Right. So, so let's move to a, a men's health question, and it's one that's probably on the top of a lot, lot of uh, people's uh, mind, and that has to do with pre PSA, prostatic specific antigen screening blood test. And if it's abnormal, what do you do? What is the right thing to do? And, uh, you know, do you believe in the g digital rectal exam? A lot of people are dumping that particular mm -hmm. test. Let's talk about prostate cancer screening. What's, what's the best prostate cancer screening plan, Eugene? I usually recommend starting screening at the age of 55. Um, you know, even our society is asking us to be a little less aggressive about screening. So, in people who are at high risk for a disease like having a family history or a first degree relative like a father or a brother, um, I'll screen them once a year. I do do the rectal exam, um, partly so that I know what the prostate feels like, just to make sure I don't miss something. Um, really abnormal, but it also gives me a little bit more information about the size of the prostate, sometimes the prostate health can give me a clues about how well people are going to the bathroom or if they're having problems going to the bathroom. Um, and by the way, you also check the stool for blood and you've got mm -hmm. a double screen for colon cancer. I mean, it's, I think it's a ma an important test. We should still be doing it sure. every year after 50 in men. Mm -hmm. Go on, I'm, I interrupted oh, you. Oh, no, and um, I've been backing off on screening on people with low risks. So if there's no real risk factors, I'll give the option of checking every other year instead of every mm -hmm. year. And so low risk are people without family without history? Without family history, low PSAs initially, people who aren't showing our normal rectal exams. Yeah, there so. you go. Nate, what would you follow up? You disagree, you agree? That, that's a controversial 
scenario. It is. I mean, it was a hot topic. The United States uh, Preventive Service Task Force gave it a grade D rating. So yeah. it kind of the American Urologic Association was up in arms about this, and the Urologic Association kind of changed their tune a little bit. And they used to start screening at 40, and now it's 55 to 69. And people that don't have, uh, you know, they're not high risk with family history or African American. Uh, uh, African American yep, have a higher, higher risk, risk of prostate yep. cancer. And the the checking, doing the rectal exam and the PSA every other year instead of every year. And now they have, in any screening, they have this coined term of shared decision making. So when you have something, when you have screening like that that's controversial, it's, it involves a discussion with you and your patient. Uh, and the patient shares the responsibility yeah, going yes bit, or no a little bit I think I think we're moving more from a paternalistic way of dealing with patients to a more of you know maternalistic <laughs> no that's not fair paternalistic meaning, meaning the doctor like, says this, this is, is what it's we're going to do and but getting the patient on board because yeah it is controversial because you know the prevalence uh, is uh, the prevalence and incidence ratio is a lot different you know most people don't die from their prostate cancer they die with it but uh, there definitely are the patients that you want to find ahead of time because there is a lead time with any screening test. Like if the PSA is elevated and you find cancer, that's about six or seven years before that they'd actually have localized symptoms from their cancer. You know, I've, uh, oftentimes what will happen is, okay, it looks like there is you know, an elevated PSA. You can feel a, a hard lesion on the digital exam okay, we'll do a biopsy, they do a biopsy and they can say, well, this is grade eight or 10 or one or two or, what's, what are the grades and what does that grading mean? I think we're talking about the Gleason score. Yeah, the Gleason score on the, on the biopsy of the prostate. So the Gleason score is determined by how the cells from the biopsy look on the microscope. The pathologist will use certain criteria to gauge how aggressive they think the prostate cancer is. And typically on a biopsy, it'll go from six to 10. Um, six is the most common type of prostate cancer when we talk about prostate cancer being slow growing and not very aggressive. Say that again. When you hear about prostate cancer not being aggressive yeah. or slow growing, you're typically talking about those Gleason six cancers. Right. The more aggressive they get, the closer it is to that 10 number. 10 is a very aggressive disease yeah. that you don't want to have. Um, and, and that's really predictable. I mean, if, if you have a Gleason 10, you know, you've you got to be bad. looking for it somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, it's spread, you're worried. Yeah, because yeah. the PSA, as well as the, the histology or what it looks like under the microscope, is going to uh, push you into a certain direction. Do I need to be worried about it somewhere else? Do I need to just consider it localized? And all of that comes into. You know, do I screen? Just like the original true/false yeah. question, do they do they need you know curative intent, or do they just need simple observation? Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We could have more questions from you. Uh, we really do appreciate your questions. A urologist sees many different problems and diseases. Some of these are more or less related. Some have their own special needs for treatment. Since I'm a urologist and I deal with uh, conditions of the kidney, bladder, prostate, uh, common, uh, ki common conditions I treat is kidney uh, tumors, kidney stones, bladder cancers, prostate problems, prostate cancers. So symptoms like for kidney stones, what most common symptom would be like somebody with flank pain, uh, blood in the urine. Sometimes they'll have come in with like, they usually come into the emergency room with severe pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, blood in the urine. Uh, if we're dealing with prostate issues, sometimes they'll have trouble passing their urine, controlling their urine, blood in the urine. To the only way to diagnose prostate cancer is by doing the blood test and exam. Uh, but then we also tell them that just because it's abnormal doesn't mean it's cancer. But we have to do a biopsy to find out if there's cancer or not. Because if we don't screen them, uh, a lot of times when we diagnose prostate cancer, it's too late to cure them because they already spread. And the only way to do that is by doing the PSA blood test. Sometimes they'll come in with problems with ejaculation, like premature ejaculation, but most commonly it's for erectile dysfunction. Uh, they are not able to have, a, either not have, be able to have a normal erection, or they can have an erection, but it doesn't last long enough to be able to have satisfactory sexual intercourse. One uh, uh, thing that has changed uh, our treatment a lot is 
uh, the discovery of Viagra uh, for erectile dysfunction. Before, uh, this is about, about 20 years ago. Before that, they did not have that option. And then we would be doing more invasive uh, types of treatments. Uh, but with the uh, advent of Viagra and now other pills like Levitra, Cialis, it, uh, uh, it's a less invasive way of treating erectile dysfunction. Uh, and although it doesn't work for everyone, it is definitely the first thing that we go to. The other thing I can think of in urology, uh, and this is not specific to men and women too, with kidney stones, uh, before I'd say more than 30 years ago, we had to do open surgery on all kidney stones. Uh, now we have a lot of different uh, equipment available, like fan, we got nice scopes uh, with which we can go in uh, without making incisions and either breaking the stones up with a laser or we can do break up the stones for, with a shockwave machine. Urologyhealth.org, urologyhealth.org, it's uh, run by the American Urology Association Foundation and it's meant for uh, I don't know, urology conditions for the general population to read about it. Uh, what are the symptoms? What are the common conditions that urology treat? And that's a very non-biased, very well researched uh, site. This is your show, and your questions are key to our show discussion, so call in your questions about men's health to 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Uh, that was a nice uh, discussion with Dr. Bott, and he talked about robotic surgery just a bit now. I mean, are there, is that something that you guys do? It's kind of taken over. It's very hard to find people who uh, do the older version of the prostatectomy, these are the removal of the prostate these days. And now, for a while, it, there was no difference between the regular version and the robotic. Now, we have scientific data that says you can preserve more function, or what's the reason to do, what's the reason to do robotic? I think robotics just allows easier recovery. You know, we know documented blood loss is less. There's a question if continence is a little bit, uh, is it gained quicker? Uh, but the treatment of prostate cancer is so controversial because we over treat prostate cancer and it's a cancer that's so linked to function you know if we take out a kidney tumor sometimes the patient doesn't even remember what side they had their surgery on yeah but when you have a cancer that's treated that's so linked to urinary function and sexual function it can impact your daily life every day uh, so the days of uh, you know fluid incontinence and never have an erection again I think those those have changed a little bit with robotics uh, most residents now that are coming out of training, basically, I, there's probably some residencies that they don't know how to do an open prostatectomy anymore, but... I did three in residency, mm -hmm. three open prostates. And, and a thousand million. But, I mean, in the end, a, a good surgeon does their surgery well. So are there ones that do good open surgery? Of course yeah. there are. Are there ones that do bad robotic surgery? There is. But I just think that uh, technically, uh, we can show a video just about a robotic uh, prostatectomy and discuss a little bit about just the, the benefits that it provides. Now, uh, we've got a, a, a video. Let's, let's, let's look at this video. Can you explain what's yeah. going on there? So with robotics, people <coughs> think that uh, you know, the robot does the operating, but basically you're sitting down at a console where uh, on the console, your your fingers are actually moving these instruments. Like there's a scissors, there's a scissors in the right hand, and then there's another instrument called a bipolar or a Maryland in the left hand. And oh, I delete that. Here, there. uh, there's a get rid of it right there. Like that. It's actually very similar and, to a video game. Yep. It and is. so the bladder's up above you. We can go to the next clip. Uh, so with prostatectomy, your prostate is actually is the organ that sits between your bladder and your urethra. It's contiguous with the bladder. Here's a demonstration of the bladder is down here and the surgeon is basically dissecting the bladder off of the prostate. And the prostate gland is right here. We can go to the next. So here is the urethra is it this structure right here. So part of the surgery is taking the prostate and the bladder and separating those two structures and then dissecting the prostate 
off of the urethra, and you can see you're getting a glimpse of the catheter right there. Uh, we'll go to the next. So after the prostate is removed, uh, you have to sew the bladder. What they're doing here now is sewing the bladder back to the urethra. So what makes this surgery critical is not only do you have the sphincter muscle down here that is uh, after the prostate's out responsible for your continence but you also have the nerves for erections that run right here so surgery depending on the extent of their cancer uh, you know and various other anatomical differences of, of their prostate can make it challenging to spare the nerves and to get a good length of the urethra. But I just think the visualization from robotics and the suturing, you know, you have, you know, many more degrees of freedom of suturing than you do do an open surgery. And Here. this is the catheter? Yes. That's the catheter. That, that light? Uh, Red. Yep. That's using just the to catheter. You're going to retie the urethra around the catheter. They're using yep. that to show you where the urethra is. is. But okay. the, the true benefit here, especially in this part of the surgery, is that you can actually see what you're doing. Um, the old surgery, you were kind of si sewing things blindly, you're tying knots blindly, you really couldn't see. But here, you can see the camera moving in and out. First of all, it's high definition, so the optics are really good. Second of all, it's stereoscopic, meaning there's, there's two lenses there, so everything's rendered in 3D. Mm -hmm. So you actually have depth perception but you can bring that camera right up there. So you can actually see exactly what you're doing. You can precisely place those sutures there. And I think from a technical standpoint, you can just do a more precise job um, sewing things back together right there. But okay. it's still a major surgery, I think, with yeah. laparoscopic and robotics. You see these small incisions on the outside, and you think mm -hmm. that something small went on in the inside, but yeah. it's not necessarily true. I mean, it's still okay. a major operation, and All it right. has a risk of complications. Wow, that's really neat. Well, I, you know, my, my question is, uh, you mentioned that urinary incontinence is a problem. That oftentimes is temporary, correct? Is that, is that, usually. Most usually, it, the, 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 you can, the, the continence comes back. People can control their leaking. Usually healing will happen within that first year. So most, I tell people to be patient, to kind of expect a year before we know where things settle. So but you wear a little pad for, for a year or so. And you can, some people get continence faster than others. Um, we, we sometimes have them do exercises called Kegel exercises yeah. that women do sometimes to help strengthen those muscles to, to kind of gain uh, function. But yeah, I mean, sometimes we, we hope that people will be pretty dry. Maybe they have to use a pad or two. Um, but ideally, they're going to be fairly, very dry. Uh, but not everybody's going to have that outcome. There are some people who will have significant incontinence. So, and the other one is sexual dysfunction. Explain that problem. Well, men are made up with basically four different nerve sets. You know, you have emission, ejaculation, erections, and orgasm or sensation. But the nerves that run next to the prostate just are responsible for erections. So doing a surgery and depending on the extent of disease, sometimes you have to take those nerves. And so it makes it difficult to get natural erections. And so that's going to result in requiring supplementation afterwards in various forms. Supplementation meaning? Pills, injections, pump. And then the last resort is called a penile prosthesis. Okay, so those are, but they have the rest of it. They don't lose the other parts You're of it. You're nowhere near the nerves for sensation. Oh, wow. Yeah, no sensation, but you'll lose the ejaculation because you're getting rid of those structures during the surgery. So, all right, but the orgasm is still there. Yes. That's uh, reassuring. Have you ever said orgasm on this show ever before? Oh, probably a couple I, times. I don't, don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I don't have the inhibitory, to ask my wife, the inhibitory <laughs> thing is. No filter. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, we have some good questions, and I appreciate, I appreciate the questions. Um, the, within uh, the last two years, husband has lost lots of weight. Uh, down to bone and flesh and is still active, any reason he could be losing such, so much weight? Why is he losing weight? That's not specific to urology, and I'll give you a quick answer. A lot of reasons. Some of them are GI tract reasons. Some of them are emotional reasons. Sometimes there is cancer. Sometimes there's an infection. I think the major thing is, though, when people lose weight like that, you need to be checked out. And so 
that was that's a take-home message I would love for you all to have. Uh, doctor, uh, men don't always come in to be, be seen when they should. And weight loss is one reason to come in and see the doctor. Was that a good any, add anything more? <laughs> okay. 89-year-old, very active, good health, takes two tamulosin, four milligrams each morning, or Flomax, two Tylenol, or two Aleve, and finds it decreases the discomfort and amount of time he needs to get up at night and is wondering what the doctors think about that regimen for getting up, preventing having to get up at night. Let's talk about nighttime nocturia, nighttime yeah. urine. Eugene. Very common. Starts around the age of 50. Um, you know, I, I focus more on the bother with people. You know, there, there are guys who get up a couple times a night, it doesn't bother them. There are guys who get up many times a night, it doesn't bother them. I got guys who get up once a night and it bothers them. And it, it's kind of a subjective thing, but being on the two Flomax, if, if you're happy with it, you feel like you're emptying, you check your urologist and they see that you're emptying, you're not getting infections, I think I don't see a problem with that. As an intern, it's my only problem with Flomax and the other uh, that in that group is that a lot of times you get up to go to the bathroom and then your blood pressure drops. Mm -hmm. You get orthostatic hypotension. And uh, so as long as you're, you're not lightheaded when you stand up or you can stand up, catch your pressure before you charge away from the bed, then that's fine. Uh, but you have to be aware of the, that risk of that particular group of prostate medicines. Uh, I, you know, uh, I'm up twice a night, and uh, I've often said that if you're up at one time at night, you're healthy. <laughs> twice a night, you're an older guy, and uh, no big wheel. Uh, whoop. Female caller is bothered with kidney stones several years ago. She was told to drink distilled and warm water. Is this a good way to pass kidney stones, and why the distilled and warm water, and what's the other treatment options? Nate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that distilled water. Um, they're they're you know, worried about the minerals it, in the it, water, and it might there's, bring. There's some stuff. thought about: Are you drinking soft water? Are you drinking? Do you live somewhere where you have well water, and mm -hmm. so the, num the amount of solute in the water can increase your risk? Uh, you know, the big takeaway is people that have a history of kidney stones. You know, in a good workup, you should take a lot of times a surgical disease and make it a medical disease. Where uh, people that have a history, they're they need a workup, which is called a 24-hour urine collection, where you do check the urine for 24 hours. You do a few labs just to make sure there's not a metabolic problem. And sometimes it can be hyperparathyroid yeah, or I something just, like that. I just had a patient not too long ago that's getting their parathyroid hormone uh, or parathyroid glands taken out. Uh, but you know, sometimes just even behavioral changes, you can eliminate the growth and recurrence of their stones. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and like you said earlier, lots of water. I think. Tap water is a good thing. I think it's the volume of water that's more important than the actual what, 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 what type of water. Yeah. I've not been a big pusher of water in my practice. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you got to drink a lot of water because this is a healthy thing. But when you're talking with urologists who deal with kidney stones, okay, we need to drink well, water. Well, there's a nice mix because you start drinking too much water, then you're bothered by your frequency and your urgency. And you're up and 20 times at night, and of course, the, your, so your sodium drops. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 89 year old, 65 uh, year old uh, man from Kimball has a very low testosterone count. 65, low testosterone. Doctors said they might put him on hormone treatment to fix the issue. Why would his testosterone be low? Mm -hmm. And what do you recommend for people with low testosterone? And should we be testing all these people t for testosterone levels? Depends if he has symptoms. The, uh, and what the, symptoms? Well, a lot of times symptoms, it's, it's fatigue. Sometimes it can be like depressive, well, everybody's got de fatigue. depressive symptoms. A lot uh, of people are depressed. Just uh, they, they just don't have the energy to do what, they, what they're used to doing. Uh, low sexual desire, low libido. Uh, but, you know, I'm in the kind of the, the group that I treat symptoms and not just a number, but usually a testosterone less than 300 is what's called low testosterone. And, Treatment makes these men feel better, gives them more energy. There's some question, can it help with erectile function? But there's some risks to going on testosterone. What, yeah, and those risks are? Well, you have to follow their PSA. 
Uh, you have to follow their blood counts. Because you worry about prostate cancer and it, it you just, kicks it. You just have to check that. Is it still safe? It's still safe to do testosterone, even in patients that have had prostate cancer treatment. But another one is polycythemia, where the blood count gets too high, so you have to check blood counts as well when you're on yeah. testosterone. Right. Uh, I have, I, back uh, years ago, I, I did a lot of this, and then I kind of backed off as my patient population got older and older, and I, I tested less. But when I found a low testosterone and symptomatic, I treated with the testosterone shots that are cheaper than the, the topicals also, yep. and the patches and all that. They're markedly cheaper. Uh, what's your take on that, Eugene? They're cheaper, it's more accessible to people, but the problem is you kind of develop these peaks and valleys then. So you get this big surge, people feel great, and then as they get to the end of their cycle, they start feeling mm -hmm. not so great. So if you can get the patches or the creams and things like that, you get a more steady state as far as the level of testosterone, mm -hmm. but you're right, it, it is much cheaper. Sometimes that's yeah. a convenience and factor. And there's some other endocrine workup that you can do to see is it testicular failure or is it low gonadotropin? Exactly. Yeah, I think too many um, people don't actually do work up work why out. why the, tes the testosterone is low. And sometimes it's not just a shot or a cream, sometimes a pill will help it depending on where the where the defect is coming from or where the, the low counts are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so you wait for symptoms before you screen. You don't screen everybody no at symptoms. certain age. Right. And if, if I'm 80 and I'm low testosterone, what do you say to that? Mm. I've, seen, I've seen some <laughs> studies talk about the benefits of actually giving in to older men for reasons for muscle gain, yeah. health reasons. Sometimes cognition. it's actually a depression issue, yes, mm -hmm. for cognition. I think from a health standpoint, if we're talking about gaining muscle mass and getting them more healthy, I think that's actually reasonable. Um, but if we're doing it just because we're tired, you know, the companies that were selling testosterone actually got in trouble recently because they were advertising so widely, basically asking everyone over 50 they don't feel like they're 18 anymore. And yeah, yeah, we, we no one, no one's going to feel. patches, you know, because they're <laughs> really profitable for us. I mean, I, and so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to go by the symptoms. I mean, you can have a low testosterone and actually not have any of those symptoms. So. Yeah, you can have a gentleman with a testosterone of 200 with really minimal symptoms or 350 and they have a lot of symptoms. I think yeah. people forget testosterone yeah. is just a component to some of these symptoms. It's not like testosterone controls oh, sexual function or controls you know, depression, things like that. It's just a mm -hmm. part of what may be adding to that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one thing that uh, always drew me away from using testosterone supplementation was I had a number of patients who had widespread prostate cancer, you know, with uh, METs to the bone in particular. And uh, uh, basically we turned off their their uh, testicles uh, by, with medicine, or uh, and we did a lot of this in the older days. We'd just remove the testicles, mm -hmm. and then you didn't need to take pills. It was much cheaper, long term, and the cancer would go away. Which makes me worry about giving older people who you think you know they're going to have some level of prostate cancer. I mean, what do they say? Fifty to seventy-five uh, percent will have prostate cancer at eighty-five if you just did autopsies on everybody. So I'm, I, that there's the only rub to that. Any comment on that, Nate? I mean, you just, you have to screen them. I mean, it's uh, at that age, you know, it's, to, it's a whole level of controversy. Should we even be, after 70, even screening men for prostate cancer, let alone, you know, trying to find it. So if they are symptomatic and you do testosterone supplementation and they're feeling better, I mean, you can check a PSA to make sure it doesn't jump yeah. uh, significantly. Yeah. But Just monitoring, yep. watching them. Any drug has side effects and testosterone is no different. Okay. Uh, is there a, a home test to determine if the bladder is voiding completely due to restriction from an enlarged prostate? That's a, that's a really pretty good question. It's, it's called passing a catheter on your own. Yeah, I mean, you know, how much do you have left? So I, I oftentimes I, uh, we used to do, uh, in one nursing home, I have an ultrasound machine and I can see how much mm -hmm. is in the bladder after they've emptied their bladder. You know, have them empty their bladder and then see how much is left. Uh, another place, uh, we'll just put a catheter in there yeah. and see how much is left uh, instead of an ultrasound machine. Yeah, either way, what's the magic number? When someone empties their bladder and then there is how much left, you know there's a problem. 
I don't think there is a magic number. I think that as we get older, we're not going to be as efficient. Our bodies aren't as efficient. So for me, I will actually be okay with a higher number if you're not emptying completely, so long as you're not having problems like bladder stones or urinary tract infections or killing off your kidneys because the pressure is too high. There are some guys who don't, I mean, they, they go along and they don't empty completely and they do fine. I don't necessarily feel like there's a problem as long as they're not hurting their kidneys and right. having problems. But I will say the younger you are, the more abnormal that is. And so a, a lower number may be a little bit more unusual in someone who's younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go to that question about bladder uh, catheters. Uh, I have a patient who uh, had uh, had gone too long with benign prostatic hypertrophy and his bladder got stretched and stretched and the muscles that were normally emptying kind of gave up. And then finally the prostate was a benign prostatic hypertrophy. They did a rotor rooter and took the uh, prostate out of there. But now he has a bladder that doesn't work. So he puts a catheter in there, uh, you know, three or four times a day uh, and there's no problem. You have a lot of patients who do that? Yep. Uh, I know that uh, two of my patients uh, use a catheter, they, they clean it and they re do it and they, they need a new catheter about every three to six months. They use that same old catheter for mm. three to six months. But right now, the big deal is a brand new, a catheter, new catheter every, every time, time yeah. which is hugely expensive. Um, and you know full well that both groups, whether you're getting a brand new catheter every time or whether you're just cleaning that catheter carefully and, and going four times a day with that same catheter that's kept in a bath that's sterile, sterilizing, um, that uh, they're all going to have some bacterial growth in those bladders. What's your comment about that? Uh, issue of having to use a new catheter every time. You sounded like you kind of like that idea, but over there. Uh, the, the rates of infection, or I should say clinically relevant infections, is a little bit lower, but you're right. I mean, anybody that has any foreign body ever in their body, especially their bladder, they're going to be colonized with bacteria. So every time you check your urine culture, a lot of times it's going to be show infection. But is that clinically relevant or not? usually not unless they're having symptoms like fevers or pain mm -hmm. uh, but there's definitely a benefit to clean intermittent catheterization where that bladder still goes through its fill and empty cycle uh, and the rate of uh, problematic infections is much less than having an indwelling catheter mm -hmm. yeah that's about it you agree yeah uh, I remember when the whole issue of clean, a fresh catheter every time came out, insurances weren't really covering that mm -hmm. initially, and I think that's changed over time. More insurances will pay for it, so it's becoming less of a fine. I, I remember when people had to pay for each individual catheter, which was a big deal. I think that's becoming a little less, but yeah. Mm -hmm. a anyone I can try to convince to catheterize themselves over having an indwelling catheter, I try to do that, but not everybody can. Sometimes it's a manual dexterity thing. Yeah, or, that, that's the thing. You, you, we can come up with a number of ways to to decrease the outlet resistance, like opening up the prostate or these various medications, but there's really no medicine or treatment or surgery that makes the bladder contract better that's effective. Okay. Now we have two groups of medicines that help with a person who has a benign prostatic hypertrophy that's blocking the flow. One is this fast acting one that we talked about, Flomax is the generic, or is the brand name of of one. Um, and then there's another that, that basically uh, reduces testosterone uh, effect on the uh, prostate. Uh, the first one uh, has the side effect of making you pass out and when you get up in the, in the middle of the night, lowers your blood pressure. But for the most part, it works pretty well in some people. The second one uh, really gradually works better and better over a long period of time, but it loses but it, it blocks the testosterone and you end up with uh, sexual dysfunction, mostly. Uh, how do you use those medicines and when do you not use them? 
the medicine you're talking about that shrinks the gland down works better on people with bigger prostates, and that's where the physical exam that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. is important to get an idea for how big how the big gland, that gland is. Because it doesn't, it's not as effective in people with smaller glands. And so, oh, if okay. I see someone, I feel their gland is not very small. I probably am less less likely to recommend the medicine that shrinks the gland versus um, someone with a bigger gland. You always mention the sexual dysfunction. There are some guys who just won't even risk it. Uh, they the don't sexual wanna, function is important to them. Yes, and so if they don't even want to potentially risk losing sexual function, it's not something that I offer. And so, yeah, but you could go right to the terp. Well, these—that's the thing. You know, years ago, uh, resection of the prostate was the most common procedure in the country. But with the advent of these medicines, granted, with uh, the medicines that shrink the prostate it just stops the, the next hormone beyond testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. So their testosterone actually can go up a little bit, but still, you know, you have some of those men that have sexual dysfunction, but I think the push for both those medicines, two large randomized studies showed that people that were on both medicines that had enlarged prostates yeah. did better. But there's some men that have no desire to take two medications for the rest of their life that rather have some sort of procedure, which there's various kinds now to open up the prostate, and other ones want to avoid surgery at all costs, yep. and they'll stay on their medicines. I'd take this, the terp. I think we should do more terps. I, I like avoiding medicine when you can. Yeah. That's from an internist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 60 year old male, PSA has always been less than one until recently when, uh, when it was 18. Uh, antibiotic was given and PSA dropped to two. What is your recommendation for follow-up testing? Ooh. I always watch those carefully. Uh, when in, in that situation, it's, it's very common to get something called prostatitis or inflammation of the prostate where your numbers... With an infection. Yeah, and a lot of things can affect the uh, PSA, including infection and inflammation. So when you see a sudden spike like that that goes down after treatment, you usually are okay watching it, but I always just watch it just in case that's some sort of a pattern where the number starts rising over time. So I would just check it, the PSA from time to time. Good question. And a rectal exam. And a rectal exam. Mm. Frequent urination every hour during the day and was wondering what the issue was or the reason. Can normally make it a couple hours during the night, but still remains an issue. Frequency of urination. Nate. The, uh, I think the, the thing that's been shown to bring men to the doctor or the urologist is nocturia. So I always try to, yep, I try to uh, get a handle on are their, di are their daytime symptoms as bad as their nighttime symptoms? Because sometimes night si nighttime symptoms aren't always a result of a bladder or prostate issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's sleep apnea or fluid overload, edema, heart or failure. swelling in the lower extremities. But Yeah, heart uh, failure. In those patients, I always monitor how well they're empty in their bladder, how well, or what's their level of bother, and uh, as long as their urine's clean, you know, you can try those various medications that we started before and see if you can improve their frequency and urgency. But there's kind of two groups of symptoms. There's the symptoms that are more like overactive, like frequency, urgency, but then there's the obstructive type symptoms where people have slow flow, it's hard to get started, I feel like I'm not empty, and so I kind of try to uh, see primarily where their symptoms lie. Right. Urinary infections every six weeks has taken antibiotics, spoken with infectious disease physicians regarding these infections. They discovered that it was an antibiotic resistant infection, ESDLS. What options are there for treatment? Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment too, but I don't know. Really um, I mean, that's, I don't think it's a simple solution. There can be a lot of different causes. You could be emptying your you, they may not be emptying their bladder completely. Um, yeah. There could be a foreign body like a stone that's getting infected. Stones are notorious for harboring bacteria and they won't go away until you treat the stones. You need to scope them, don't you? Recurring sometimes, infections you need to do. Sometimes you gotta scope them. Um, CT. Yeah, I would at least start off with a CT to yeah. make sure it's not a kidney stone. I'd make sure that they're emptying their bladders completely. Wow. Um, yeah, there's a whole host of things that could yeah. be going on. You know, uh, I think we overtreat uh, bladder infections uh, a lot of time. Like we know, 80% uh, of all women in a nursing home are going to have asymptomatic bacteria. Asymptomatic bacteria. You can justify an antibiotic at the, every time you mm -hmm. turn around. If they just they you know they act a little bit different. Oh, bladder infection. Oh, here's an antibiotic and 
there goes their normal flora. Mm -hmm. You know, their microbiome is wiped out. That's a bad thing. We want to avoid antibiotics. I've used a lot of vitamin C supplement f to prevent urinary tract infection. And uh, if you, you take these, your, these bladder, these, these women in the nursing home, and I put them on vitamin C four times a day. And I know the studies are not really back, but I have seen it and works. seen it. It works. You yep. agree? <laughs> the, uh, the, the studies are conflicting. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of things that we feel that decrease infections, but, you know, and th that's the whole discussion is, is the data really real world experience where you have, you know, increasing more fluids or, you know, in women urinating before or after intercourse. Uh, but there's there's definitely Particularly something. Particularly if they're in the nursing home. There's definitely something to that say. That was a joke. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I caught it now. Yeah, I'm sorry. The uh, you know there's there's some. We've got one minute and we've got three questions. There's some quick. benefit with like uh, vaginal estrogen and probiotics yes. and things like that 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 you can actually utilize instead of antibiotics. Yes. To decrease their risk. Okay, yes or no, uh, and I'm going to, Eugene, a caller from Mitchell says, is there any research in the medications for erectile dysfunction that have a side effect of decreasing hearing? Hearing? I know that sometimes you can have visual changes. Mm -hmm. There are receptors in the eyes, but I've... I've, I've heard, heard visual it. changes, but mm -hmm. I haven't heard the hearing problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you explain he's, it? He's just not hearing his wife say no. What was that? He's <laughs> like, I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what he's thinking. <laughs> Can you, yeah, can you explain a TURP operation in 30 seconds? It's T-U-R-P, transurethral like, pressure. It's like a melon baller, a hot melon baller. It scoops yeah. out the prostate. Yeah, I think of it as the orange and the orange peel. You go in there with the scope and you scrape out the orange and you leave the orange peel behind. All right, so, and Peyronie's disease, what is that? Curvature of the penis. Yeah, kind of a chronically erected penis. Much higher prevalence than what's documented. So there's, that's a real deal. Yep. And someone called in and said, how am I doing? And I can't tell you that, but They're I'm doing, doing good. Yeah. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc Quiz question, true or false? Active surveillance, which means just monitoring prostate cancer with lab and x-ray and going without surgery, radiation or chemotherapy, is an option in some prostate cancers, true or false? And the answer is true. It was Gloria Putz of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Gloria, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. For more than 16 years, the Prairie Doc organization has endeavored to enhance health and diminish suffering by providing useful information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Prairie Doc physicians and health professionals continue to answer your questions each week, creating a vast Prairie Doc library of medical information available to you and your family 24 hours a day. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook and YouTube for free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc library. Recently, I received a meant to be humorous email that explained why life is simpler for men than for women. Our last name always stays the same. The garage is mostly all ours. Mechanics tell us the truth. We get extra credit for the slightest act of thoughtfulness. Our underwear is only $8.85 for a three pack. We can play with toys all our lives. And finally, we do the same work but get more pay. The last singer struck a dissonant chord. I know that even though things have been getting better over time for women, equal rights and equal pay is a glass ceiling that has not yet been broken. After all, it's been less than 100 years since women have had the right to vote. The gender wage gap continues, violence against women persists, and poverty and homelessness is worse for women, especially single mothers. Plain and simple, unfair discrimination toward women persists. Because of these injustices, there has been some societal rejection of discussion about the differences between the sexes as politically incorrect. I get that because 
Despite some improvements in societal equality, there remains perpetrated bigotry against those different, whether LGBTQ, people of different color, or simply people of different gender. However, from a medical standpoint, there are important and real dissimilarities between women and men, which are solely based on physiology, like hormonal differences that influence behavior and size differently. For example, in a study applying topical testosterone to half of a large group of normal men, the men with increased testosterone were less willing to check themselves for mistakes and appeared overconfident. This could explain why men who naturally produce more testosterone than women are usually more reluctant to admit when a problem becomes obvious and less willing to seek help or <laughs> ask for directions. Another example, the average U.S. adult man weighs 196 pounds and is 5 foot 9 inches tall, while the average adult woman weighs 168 and is just under 5 foot 4. Incidentally, average U.S. people weigh about 30 pounds more than they did 50 years ago. Recognizing the physical differences between the sexes should not mean either sex is inferior. We should combat unjust inequalities while embracing what makes us unique. Understanding the biological differences between the sexes should simply allow us to find treatment for medical and behavioral problems and how best to love and support each other. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Eugene Park and Dr. Nathan Bockholt, both of Urology Specialists, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, dear friends. Thank you so much for volunteering to come to our studio in Jaeger Hall on the South Dakota State University campus in Brookings. Their dedication to the people of South Dakota is greatly appreciated and meaningful, and thank you for your information and intelligence here. Well, that does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Pick up your phone or jump on the internet. You direct the show with your questions. You may ask anything. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. All of us want our family, neighbors, and friends to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources like Dr. Holm and his guest physicians. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the volunteer board of directors of the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established to support the work of the Prairie Docs. With your charitable donation, you can help the foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. This mission is so very important to rural communities and residents in particular across South Dakota and neighboring states. Please consider a personal or corporate gift. Just go to prairiedoc.org to find more information on how you can help. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information.
and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, CoBank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Brown Clinic, Aberdeen District Medical Society, 3rd District Medical Society, 7th District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftel Communications.